As criminal mass casualty incidents resulting from an actual shooter have increased, it's become very apparent that we are not as prepared in response as we should be. These horrific events can occur anywhere. They happen in our places of worship, our schools, our businesses, communities large and small, we're all at risk. It is imperative that we look at historical data and be critical both of ourselves and the industries which we serve in. There's an outward call for us to work forward. It's imperative that both fire, EMS, and police work together to engineer a system that is not individualistic, but is collaborative. The response solution needs to be manageable, efficient, and most importantly, to use service personnel as experts in their field. It is our ethical responsibility for fire, police, and EMS to work together to achieve the ultimate goal, to protect and save lives. Active shooter events are not new in our society. Quite frankly, they've been around for hundreds of years. But what we're looking at recently is a proliferation of uh, the rapid mass murders, which are four or more people killed in 20 minutes. Those have been on a steady increase since the 1990s, and 2012 set an all-time record with 16 rapid mass murders occurring in our society. Although active shooters have been around for hundreds of years, the first widely publicized one was in Camden, New Jersey where Howard Underwood had walked down the streets uh, for 13 minutes and killed 12 people, wounding four. A lot of times we look at the Texas Bell Tower incident as kind of the precipitous uh, random mass murder uh, in public, which there Charles Whitman killed 17 and wounded 32. But what we need to look at, uh, the stats are important to look at and to analyze uh, the wounding patterns and how many people are injured and killed, but what is missing in this is a collaborative effort between police and fire and how best we can bring those resources to bear to save lives. Predominantly, law enforcement has focused just on the tip of the spear when we focus on how do we intercede and interrupt the active shooter. However, we neglect the fact that the timeline of these events have been compressed to where the average time in years 2007 through 2012 is three minutes or less. Aurora, Colorado, tragic incident, almost 50 people wounded, 12 people killed, occurred in about 90 seconds. What that tells us is it's imperative that if we want to have the biggest impact on rendering life-saving ability, it's to get our partners from the fire service into the scene quickly. So the key point is that the paradigm has to change for law enforcement. Instead of looking just solely on getting in there, stopping the shooter, which is important, we need to shift and we need to include as a priority getting fire EMS into the scene quickly to render uh, life-saving efforts. In 2007, we started taking uh, a serious look at the various criminal mass casualty events and active shooters dating back to 1949 till present. What we found is over 300 of those events, 93% are over before law enforcement intercedes into the scene. Out of those incidents, only 31 have been documented that law enforcement has had a positive influence engaging the shooter and stopping the killing pattern. With that in mind, we need to look at our overall strategy and work with our fire EMS counterparts and get them into the scene to have the greatest impact in rendering life-saving aid to those wounded in an active shooter criminal mass casualty event. I just want you to stay in the line with me. We need to know what's going on. Okay. Okay? I am on the floor. Okay. Really the precipitous event for law enforcement that changed our response paradigm was the Columbine Massacre in 1999. There, 13 uh, students were killed and 20 were wounded. When we looked at that incident, prior to the Columbine, the standard law enforcement protocol was to contain, isolate, and evacuate around the incident. The tragedy of Columbine was that the killers in that incident were able to finish their slaughter in about 17 minutes. They ended up roaming the halls of Columbine, taunting some of the students, engaged law enforcement and fire with some random gunfire from the library. But overall, their killing spree was done in 17 minutes, and Klebold and Harris ended their lives in the library around 45 minutes. 
What we learned from that is that law enforcement had to make a, had to make a major shift and no longer could we just simply wait for SWAT and to isolate. We had to move in and try to intercede and mitigate the shooter. We all know that the Columbine massacre changed the paradigm for how law enforcement responds to these types of events. Since Columbine, law enforcement has focused heavily on small unit tactics and how to intercede and interrupt the shooter. Unfortunately, a lesson that came out of Columbine was the Dave Sanders story. Over the course of three hours, Dave ultimately bled out because we were unable to get fire EMS support to him. So now we believe the paradigm needs to change again, and that is getting fire EMS into the scene quickly to render life-saving aid. In order to better understand our resp response in these incidents, we have to take on a healthy dose of statistics. The wound data and munitions affecting this team did a study from Vietnam to the first Gulf War. In this study, we found the victims that, to which their injuries resulted in death, we can be the greatest effect with those wounds in that percentage of casualty from five minutes to two hours. Now we have to be cautious when looking at these studies because they are based off of military events. The reason why we have to be cautious on these studies is because military people are exposed to a wider range of munitions and ordinances and are also wearing protective gear. And a very important point from that study, they found that only 10% of people died after the initial care was initiated. So therefore it's important that we get care to the victims as soon as possible. The military has gotten very good about saving their casualties. If you look from World War I to the War on Terror, you'll notice that the survivability has greatly increased. And the reason why this has increased is because they have gotten initial care to the patient quicker, as well as a rapid transport to definitive care. This is where our term, the golden hour, comes from. The time of on-scene incident to the operating room table within one hour. Receiving care for a patient in this golden hour is a systemic problem. The reason why I say it's a systemic problem is because this isn't just a law enforcement event. We're going to include law enforcement, EMS, fire, 911, receiving hospitals, and many other entities. The reason why we say this is a systemic effort is if any of your combined agencies don't have the expertise, the clearly defined roles, familiarity, if they're not unified, and most importantly, if we don't have a simplified response, the whole system will be affected. The reason why we have not saved as many lives as we should have is because we don't have a response structure that is multi-agency inclusive, specifically integrating EMS within the patient's golden hour. Within the last couple of years, Parent agencies to the public safety organizations to which we work in have come out with statements on how they view we should be moving forward with an active shooter response. The U.S. Fire Service Administration in January 2013 came out with a statement. Some of the basic components of this statement to which we need to focus on are a better understanding of ICS with every organization involved. We need to develop a casualty collection point for easier victim transfer and most importantly, we need to develop a plan, update it, and train annually. In April of 2013, the International Association of Firefighters and the International Chiefs of Police came together and had a statement. The basis of the statement are is that we need to strengthen our relationships as organizations, and most importantly, we need to adapt our response. In June of 2013, the International Association of, Association of Fire Chiefs came out with a statement. An important point that they made is that we need to be better prepared to work with law enforcement. In June of 2013, the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health came out with a statement. It says, it is unlikely that any single component of the public safety infrastructure will be able to effectively and comprehensively respond to those threats posed and casualties inflicted during a hostile mass casualty shooting incident. It also goes on to say that we need to have cooperative planning with all of those entities. As of recently, the International Association of Chiefs of Police came out with a statement. It also sounded similar with the message of, are we proactively prepared to work together? Regardless of your organization, and if you're working towards these goals, the statements that we just talked about, these statements will be the lens to which your actions 
will be viewed after the fact. So what's the current fire EMS response? Well, across the nation, we're seeing a spectrum. And the spectrum goes from agencies that aren't doing anything. This could be due to funding, uh, technical expertise, uh, staffing, uh, or just the lack of desire to initiate a program. Then you have agencies who have fully technical programs with trained operators uh, performing tactical emergency medical services. So some of these forms of tactical medicine. First, we'll start with TEMS. So TEMS is Tactical Emergency Medical Services. TEMS is designed to link up with an operator of law enforcement or somebody who has technical expertise in that field. These people are either trained to assist or trained to go inside a tactical environment with that officer. Another form of tactical medicine you'll find is TCC, otherwise known as TCCC and Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Now TCC is designed for an operator, uh, specifically that law enforcement or military, and they are taught specific and few uh, medical techniques to provide self and buddy rescue. The problem with these two EMS based methods of TCCC and TAMS are cost, training, gear, and they're not simple tasks to perform. And more importantly, depending on the incident, law enforcement officers may be better utilized somewhere else. Another component of uh, tactical EMS you'll find are rescue teams. And in rescue teams, you'll take law enforcement and fire or EMS and you'll link them together in a pod and they will go through a structure providing emergency medical treatments and most importantly triaging and extracting the victims out of the structure. The inherent difficulties with the rescue team model are command and control, integration training, and you're putting firefighters in the hazard zone. The command and control issue is obvious because it takes a lot of moving parts and puts them into play. As far as integration, we are taking two entities that if they're not training a lot, if we don't have an identified plan of how to put those groups together, it's going to be a difficult process. And lastly, hazards. We're putting firefighters in the hazard zone, which may be a problem if we're not tactically prepared for it. And these three things are exacerbated because with the rescue team model, it requires a lot of training to be effective. And if you're not using a tactical EMS approach, you're going to be waiting for an all clear. The problem with the all clear is after law enforcement enter this hot zone, it's going to take well beyond the patient's golden hour until it becomes clear. So in general, what is the hang up with EMS responding to a law enforcement event? And the hang up is, is are the hazard zones. As police enter a structure, that whole entire structure, maybe even extending thereabout, are all going to be considered a hot zone. Well, in fire and EMS, we understand that if we're going to take a hazmat zone, for example, you have your hazard zone, your warm zone, and your support zone. If you're not trained to do so, you never go into a hot zone. And this is the same problem at a shooting scene. Once this threat is, has occurred, it's going to be a hot zone. And as an EMS or, or fire personnel, without being a technician, I cannot enter that hot zone. So with the hazard zone modeling, the question becomes, how can we adapt it to make it safe for EMS fire to enter? And the way we came about that was, is if we take a warm zone and kind of bubble it or embed it into a hot zone, it makes for safe transport and safe operations for fire and EMS. In the following part of this presentation, we will show you how we took a warm zone and securely embedded it into a hot zone, allowing EMS to perform their duties with law enforcement security. Because predominantly law enforcement has focused on the team tactics of responding to an active shooter, we've neglected the overall strategy of how best to use all of our resources, both from police and from fire. If we look at the nine principles of warfare that the military adopts, one of those principles is economy of force, which simply states, are we using our resources to the best of our ability to achieve the overall goal? We've looked to our partners in the military and adopted two principles, both the forward operating base and the casualty collection point, as a mechanism to utilize our, to utilize our resources efficiently. Because these type of events can draw a huge law enforcement response, the importance of the forward operating base is an area that we can bring some sort of stability in this chaotic event. Here, a first arriving sergeant, and it can be a police officer, can gain that foothold and start directing resources, i.e. the police officers, where they need to go 
what areas need to be swept, what areas need to be locked down so we can move on to the next step, which is bringing bodies to the casualty collection point. Historically, through looking at real events and through training, we recognize that law enforcement pumps a huge amount of resource into this problem. And what we found through that is law enforcement can just almost in some sense chase their tails and we're not really sure what's been cleared, what's been swept, where we need to focus uh, our energies at. The forward operating base gives us that initial uh, area of stability where we can best direct our resources, ultimately getting to the next segment, which is bringing bodies and casualties to the casualty collection point. But let's not be confused. The forward operating base is not to be looked at as the command post location or a unified command area. In fact, under NIMS, it would be best looked at as a division. So essentially, the casualty collection point is a secured area embedded or inside the hot zone where both law enforcement and fire can work side by side. Law enforcement is working on providing security for that environment while allowing fire to provide treatment to the patients. So the casualty collection point is a proven military tactic used as far back as the 1800s. It allows for simultaneous operation, it provides a bridge both for law enforcement and fire, and provides a secured area where we can render the most effective care to patients. By using these two concepts, both the forward operating base and the casualty collection point, we've changed the paradigm in which law enforcement responds to an active shooter event. In the past, law enforcement has charged into these events, however neglecting our brothers and sisters in fire, or we've tried to implement overly complicated integrated models with police and fire working side by side, trying to search out and rescue victims. What we found is we need to keep the expertise both from police and fire in their respective swim lanes and just give a casualty collection point as essentially a quick connect where police and fire can come together and have joint operations. So to detail out the police response and what that looks like, we've broke it down into three categories, response, assessment, and security. Response consists of uh, three main elements. One, law enforcement will respond utilizing rapid response tactics. Two, law enforcement will mitigate the threat posed. And three, both the sergeant and fire, i.e. the battalion chief, will link up and start the unified command. Assessment consists of two elements. Establishing that forward operating base to bring some sort of command and control on the interior, better utilizing and directing resources. And two, establishing and identifying the casualty collection point, ultimately to bring victims to. Security consists of three main elements. One, a security element surrounding the casualty collection zone. Two, a corridor lockdown security, which provides safe avenues for law enforcement to bring wounded people to the casualty collection. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is an external security element providing a safe egress-ingress route for both fire and EMS. Once EMS, or fire, has been embedded into the scene, we have three main goals, and these main goals are the basics of all MCI mitigation. They are to triage, treat, and transport. Once we're triaging, we're going to find out the number of victims, and we're going to kind of identify the severity of their injuries. After we do that, we're going to treat. And when we treat, it's only going to be the minimum life-saving techniques to stabilize that person. The big deal we want here is to be able to send that person to the operating room or for further medical attention by a physician. And lastly, transport. Transport, we're going to want to make sure that we coordinate with local hospitals so we don't overwhelm those resources. Once we do that, we are going to transport the patients to definitive medical care. It's important to not overwhelm just one hospital because in that situation, patients are going to go left untreated because we've only shifted the incident to somebody else now. It's important to pre-plan with your local hospitals and ambulance services to best figure out how to mitigate that problem. While using a joint law enforcement and fire EMS response and utilizing the CUCP, we found many benefits to it. First are going to be simultaneous tracks. We're allowing the operation to have two dual priorities enacted at the same time. Second is efficient prioritization. We're able to have a better understanding of who those critical patients are central location. We have an area where all of our resources for EMS are taking place. The forward operating base for police, being able to coordinate your interior activities. Simplicity. There is not much to this process, so it requires little training and cost. Manageable. We're able to take our two entities 
in their tracks and use a unified command to make it a little bit more efficient. And lastly, it's secure. This incident, by having the security, not only are we protecting fire and EMS, but we're also protecting the patients from further harm. Let's hit two of those benefits a little bit more with depth. First is simultaneous tracks. While law enforcement is doing their job, we're able to integrate fire and EMS. Fire and EMS are able to work on patients, triage, treating, and transporting them at the same time that law enforcement are going after the bad guy. As for simplicity, we are allowing responders to act in their comfort zone and do what they do best, which is being experts in their fields. And also, we're reducing the amount of extensive cross-training. A way to think about the CCP is like a quick connect. We're allowing law enforcement to do their job, and we are connecting or integrating fire and EMS, perform our job, connecting away, allowing law enforcement to continue on with their operations. We need to look at the active shooter across the life-saving timeline, from the point the person's injured till we get them to definitive medical care. These components, the law enforcement response, establishing the forward operating base and the casualty collection point, providing security to bring fire in, and ultimately treating the wounded inside of the CCP, ultimately transporting them to medical definitive care, cannot happen sequentially. These components need to overlap and happen simultaneously. And this is an important advantage of this approach, allowing for simultaneous operations rather than sequential, getting police and fire working together to ultimately save lives. At the onset of the active shooter event, law enforcement and fire will be dispatched simultaneously, and law enforcement will be converging the scene with a heavy amount of resources. The fire department will be staging uh, close to the location, but out of sight, given the lack of intelligence of the shooter, and just for general safety until we can combine resources. Uh, this next event is going to be the law enforcement initial entry. As described, law enforcement has arrived on scene. Our fire counterparts are staged in a safe location, but just out of sight of the structure. On the interior, the officers are working in a fashion to isolate and mitigate the shooter. At such time when they reasonably believe the threat has been mitigated, a forward operating base will be established which allows for law enforcement to better organize and disseminate the resources on the interior. Ideally, inside the FOB, we'd like to have a sergeant kind of act as the team leader in there, but if a sergeant's not available, any police officer can take command and establish the forward operating base. In this next event here, once law enforcement on the interior have determined that the threat has been mitigated or reduced, law enforcement will start to set up the casualty collection point. Declaring an MCI. We need 10 additional ambulance units and three additional fire units. Station count right now, eight red. It's also worth mentioning that the casualty collection point does not have to be in the same location as the forward operating base. Although since law enforcement has grabbed a stronghold in that forward operating base, a lot of times that has a tendency to grow into that casualty collection point. So for sake of this illustration, we will start to call this the casualty collection point. Additionally, the second and third and fourth, fifth waves of officers arriving on scene, some of those will continue onto the interior to assist, while others will continue down to fire stage in preparation to protect the egress-ingress route for fire EMS. This next event, which we've titled Victim Transfer, happens when there's enough law enforcement personnel on the interior to provide corridor lockdown security. What we mean by that is officers are responsible to lock down long corridors and allow pathways for additional police officers on the interior to start bringing the wounded to the CCP. Corridor lockdown security is an excellent way to maximize the resources of law enforcement on the interior as to mitigate us just running around and chasing our tails. We come into the facility, mitigate the threat, lock down the corridors, and begin the body drags to the CCP. Additionally, corridor lockdown is a very simple, very efficient way to manage your resources on the interior. Literally, one gun barrel can lock down an entire hallway or a vicinity in the interior, allowing for uh, safe travel for the bodies into the CCP. Also to that, if a suspect were to emerge, that person or that officer who's in a stationary uh, shooting platform can deliver effective fire and neutralize that threat. As you see here, we have law enforcement officers carrying live victims to the CCP. 
This may be a concern to some people based off of training or the liability uh, concerns. However, our basic drags and carries were an easy teach to our local law enforcement officers. This is a basic EMS, EMS task. Training law enforcement officers on basic drags and carries is a lot easier than what we used to do of embedding EMS into law enforcement formations. And by the way, the drags and carries that we teach law enforcement are the same drags and carries that we will use to move patients. What happens next is the fire introduction to the CCP. As depicted earlier, fires in the fire stage area and law enforcement will begin to set up overwatch cars or overwatch officers in position that begin to bolster and protect the egress ingress route for fire. The emphasis or the purpose of these overwatch cars is to provide stable long gun support, some refer to it as counter sniper support, onto the structure bolstering a safe corridor for fire EMS to come into the scene. Uh, it's also important to note that the overwatch protection component is really based on the size, scope, and complexity of the overall active shooter incident. This can be as little as one car or one police officer assigned, up to five or six depending on uh, the scope of the incident. As fire responds into the CCP, we're going to want that first fire officer to link up with the officer who's in charge of the CCP, the law enforcement officer. We have historically referred to that law enforcement officer as a hall boss, and then this person on the fire side will now be uh, in charge of the CCP for the fire side. With the rest of our firefighters or EMS personnel, we want to start making sure that we go through and start identifying our roles, such as medical branch and coming down into triage, treatment, and transport, and ensure those people are identified in the CCP. As we start identifying and triaging the patients, we're going to want to make sure that we go ahead and separate out the different classifications. The greens with the greens, the yellows with the yellows, and the reds with the reds. At this point in time, we don't need to worry about any black patient or the deceased. As we're triaging our patients, uh, we want to make sure that we are not waiting to identify every classification then transport. We want to start transporting the most critical as our ambulances are available. But as we start, as we start triaging our patients, and starting to transport the most critical, we want to make sure that our entrance and egress for that ambulance is clear, which is going to speed up patient transitions. It's important to note that in initial training, we pre-planned with law enforcement so they understood our needs for ambulance and fire apparatus, entrance and egress. This clear path of travel often and does get screwed up. So it's important that we work together to understand each other's needs so we can train and prevent this, because if it does happen, it's going to slow patient transport down and be all for naught. You know, one thing that we adopted from the fire service was benchmark timers. In the fire service, a lot of times they'll use a 10 minute timer to remind themselves of benchmarks along the way. What we found is establishing the CCP is a critical time sensitive aspect. So we've adopted a seven minute CCP timer that our 911 center will remind us at the seven minute mark and the 14 minute mark to make sure law enforcement is staying ahead of the game and getting that up and running. The other thing I would express to the law enforcement counterparts out there is a willingness to compromise. We have to remember that our counterparts, our brothers and sisters in the fire service have a long history and are well trained and well equipped. And we have to come together, break some of those paradigms and come at this collectively. One thing that we noticed was cross agency appreciation. It's easy to build up that wall and kind of be firefighters and cops. Uh, however, once we broke down that wall, we, we started appreciating each other and, because we had a better understanding of what each agency was responsible for on a daily basis. Daily operations. We noticed that even responding from our general domestic disturbance, which fire and police jointly come in on, to the MVAs and any other call, that they're moving a lot more fluid. And the reason why they're moving fluid is because we had already laid that groundwork of communication and, and you know, cohesiveness. Tradition. It's easy to be stuck in our ways as far as being firemen and cops. We have noticed that in order for us to move forward and our citizens, the people we are paid to protect, require that. They require us to come together and be unified in our response. And let's not forget our 911 centers. We found through doing this exercise that really police, fire, and communications are all three an integral part of this. 
And so we would encourage you to reach out to 911, invite them to your exercises, and understand their needs of how to operate within this uh, chaotic environment.